Hello, and welcome to episode 3 of Hexacon Novatel's webinar series on an introduction to GNSS. My name is Paul Verlen Gagne. I'm the Technical Marketing Specialist at Hexacon's Autonomy and Positioning Division. Thank you for joining me. This is the third of seven episodes in our Introduction to GNSS webinar series. Through the series, we have explained GNSS infrastructure and of the factors that can cause positioning errors. Today, we will illustrate the components of a satellite signal, how it's received by antennas, and what happens when the signal is processed by receivers. We are scratching the surface, so if you are ready for a deeper look at GNSS concepts, you can download our Introduction to GNSS book at novatel.com. We have already explained that satellites transmit signals, but let's go into more detail. GNSS refers to Global Navigation Satellite Systems, which includes four men's group of satellites known as constellations. We have GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou. Each constellation is managed by a different country and each have their own idiosyncrasies. To transmit information, satellites use radio frequencies allotted to GNSS and each constellation broadcasts on at least two of these frequencies. For example, GPS broadcasts at L1, L2, and L5 frequencies. Radio frequencies are used as carrier waves to send satellite system data, timing, status, and other information needed for accurate ranging. The satellite combines and modulates this data onto a carrier wave which is then transmitted toward the Earth. A carrier wave is a standard sine wave seen at the top of this slide. A GPS signal is made up of a unique identification code known as PRN code, which is used to range from a satellite to the receiver, and a navigation message that contains satellite help, status, time, and orbital information. First, the satellite combines its identification code and navigation information, and then modulates that onto the carrier wave. What result is basically a modulated signal that is sent down to a receiver. Knowing exactly how the data is superimposed onto the carrier signal, the receiver can extract the required information for satellite ranging from the modulated signal. As mentioned in episode one, you need signals from at least four satellites to determine an accurate position. These signals pass through the atmosphere toward the antenna, which senses, receives, and amplifies the satellite signal. GNSS signals can be sent after traveling from space to Earth, so choosing the correct antenna for your application is important. Having an antenna that can receive multiple signals from multiple constellations increases the accuracy and reliability of your positioning. Look at it like more access to satellite and signals means you have more data to inform your equipment. Our book and introduction to GNSS goes into detail about antenna selection to help you choose the right product for your environment and technology. Once the antenna has received, amplified, and converted the radio frequency signal from a satellite, the signal is processed by receivers to demodulate, unpack, and separate the data provided. Then the receiver outputs the positioning as latitude, longitude, and height data. Through complex equations, the receiver resolves for positioning errors and atmospheric delays and calculates a position. With additional algorithms, receivers can also gather supplemental navigational data from other sensors. But how exactly does the receiver work? Up to now, we have described the calculation on the line GNSS as determining the distance between a satellite and a receiver. We know our position is somewhere in the range of the satellite, and by multiplying the signal's travel time by the speed of light, we can measure an estimated distance from our receiver to the satellite. This simplified equation solves for what we call a pseudo-range. The distance is estimated because there could be errors in the position from atmospheric delays and other factors. This equation is straightforward, but only gives middle-level accuracy. 
there is another equation that provides better accuracy. The carrier phase calculation is a bit more complicated. Instead of solving distance based on signal's travel time, we are solving for the number of wave cycles that occurred. The cycle is counted from one tip of the wave to the next. By multiplying that by the number of cycles that have occurred, we have a far more accurate distance than when calculating pseudo range. However, while we can now calculate positioning at a centimeter level, we need to verify this measurement with another equation. This is because we don't know the total number of frequencies wave cycles. This verification process is called ambiguity resolution. Both equations are used across Genesis applications because they are useful in different ways. While pseudo range measurements are less precise, they do not have carrier phase ambiguity. This is what we mean when we say pseudo range measurements are accurate, but not precise. Conversely, carrier phase measurements are highly precise, but typically need additional infrastructure to resolve ambiguities. For this reason, carrier phase calculations are often used to calculate positioning in specific region or area like farmer's field. Use of these measurements depends on your specific applications, but I should add that Novatel receivers are designed to process both calculations and are flexible across user applications. That concludes our look into how receivers process satellite signals. Thanks for joining me for episode 3 of our introduction to GNSS webinar series. In the past three episodes, we have followed a signal as it was broadcast from a satellite, sent through the atmosphere, received by an antenna, and processed by a receiver. Our next episode will describe the ways in which errors are resolved through equipment, algorithm, and other technologies. But if you are ready to get a head start in learning these GNSS concepts, you can download our book, An Introduction to GNSS, on our website. Thank you for joining me.